So hello everybody. Um, my name is Oleg Zorkowski. I work for Hortonworks. Prior to that, I was at SpringSource. Um, you guys must be familiar with the Spring framework, so I was one of the developers of it. Um, and what I do at Hortonworks actually is a very interesting story. I quickly tell you about it. Um, uh, after leaving Spring Source, uh, one of the reasons why I left Spring Source or VMware at the time was that um, we kind of started looking into Hadoop, and uh, I just realized that um, while I can, you know, learn technology, I can read documentation. I really didn't know much about how Hadoop is applied, how and what is big data altogether. So. Um, when I came to Hortonworks, I actually specifically requested that I don't want to go into engineering just yet. I wanted to join the field. So I spent about a year and a half um, doing various different consulting engagements for Hortonworks related to the big data and kind of have a pretty good grasp of, uh, on things um, related to how Hadoop is being applied in modern enterprises. And as I was sharing with... Um, with the previous speaker just a few minutes ago, one of the things that I found very interesting while doing a lot of consulting around Hadoop is that um, I spent a lot of times writing custom code, which was kind of strange to me because here's the Hortonworks, we are selling product and Hadoop ecosystem seems to be very rich with a variety of products around Hadoop, because, uh, around Hadoop itself. But for whatever reason, I can't find a, a specific match to fit a specific problem, or even if I do find the match to fit a specific problem, then that particular product or technology doesn't really do everything that I want it to do or doesn't perform the way I want it to perform. And when I use the word want, it's not necessarily what I want, it's what my customer needed. And one of the problems we'll, I'll talk a little later on uh, was related to um, you know, uh, super fast uh, data capture or data ingest. But anyway, so today uh, the topic is uh, eye opener to the big IO. Um, kind of a catchy title. Um, what is a big IO? I don't think it's all that different. Actually, I think it's not different at all from a regular IO. Because at the end of the day, you have a variety of distribution technology, whether it's a Hadoop, Hazelcast, Grid Gain, what have you, right? But at the end of the day, your data may be distributed, your processes may be distributed, but at some point of time you have to get the data from the disk and you have to read it, right? So, and a lot of the times when you're relying on some of the technology, and this is what I noticed, um, things aren't done very efficiently. And what I'm going to do today, I'm going to quickly go through the slide deck. Um, typically, you know, I'm used to sort of a spring one format where you get like 90 minutes to talk. You can show a lot of things. You can go on a tangent and come back and go again. When you do 40 minutes, it's not that simple. And um, the other extreme of that is what I did at Scala Days, which was 20 minutes. So that's actually the talk that I really had to prepare and rehearse. But anyway, so um, let's talk about the big I.O. And um, here's kind of the agenda. So we're going to talk a little bit about what is big data kind of touch on the topic of what is structured versus unstructured, how do we measure it, store it, access it, and kind of looked at some of the high-level architecture. Um, going to talk about compute mechanics, uh, why things are slow, how easy it is to either fix them or get caught in them, right? And uh, how many of you are familiar with this concept called mechanical sympathy? So, uh, good, a couple of people. Um, I actually got very fascinated when I started reading it their blogs and things that they did with the LMAX disruptor and other things. It's very interesting, but like I said, we'll talk about it in a bit. So, um, what is a big data? I mean, it's definitely a buzzword, which is kind of appropriate for this conference, right? So, um, it means many things to many different people, just like SOA did, just like ESB did, and many other acronyms and words that we have, right? So according to Wikipedia, it's a data sets, data sets that are too large and complex to manipulate or interrogate with the standards, methods, or tools. Do you agree with that definition? I mean, it's not wrong, but is it complete? Something missing? We'll get to it in a few minutes. Um, so how do we measure big data? Is it just by its size? 
And again, the next few slides are going to be basically like raising some of these questions. Um, so, <clears throat> so what does it mean big? And if it's not the size, then what other parameters um, we um, look at to define that we have a big data problem? So um, how do we store the data? Again, another question is that was asked very often because when I came to Hortonworks, I, you know, the sales pitch was Hadoop is so great, just dump the data, we provide the distribution technology, and the MapReduce will take care of everything. Well, you know, MapReduce can take care of a lot of things, but at the end of the day, it's nothing more than just processing individual parts of the data in a distributed environment. And if, that, if such data is not written in, a, in an efficient way, then it's only a matter of time before your distributed environment will perform as a single thread on a cheap laptop, right? So um, how do we access the data? Um, you know, um, blind scanning everything, not necessarily uh, all that efficient. I actually have an interesting story. Um, my wife and I uh, flew last year from Europe back home to the United States, and um, I actually had to go straight on a business trip, so I never even made it home. So we just landed in Philadelphia, and I had to board another flight. So um, I gave her our passports, so she went in the car and left. So obviously in the States, I don't have to use passport to fly around. I can use my driver license. But all of a sudden, I'm checking all my pockets. I could not find my driver license. So I can't get on the flight. So I'm looking around everywhere. And the question I'm asking myself, have I lost it or have I misplaced it? Because if I lost it, if I knew that I lost it, then I would have called her back. She would make a loop, come back, give me my passport. Everything would be fine, right? But if I misplaced it, well, I don't know whether I did or didn't. Right? So, and that kind of gave me an interesting idea, uh, which is actually very related to the data access. How, how cool would it be? In other words, every time we look for something, we may find it, we may not. But wouldn't it be easier for us to store data, or organize data in such a way where the, the questions such as, it's not there, are answered before the questions that it is there and where it is? Think about that. So, um, and then you can bring a third-party technology to make sense of the data that you're dealing with. And uh, a big presence here from Elasticsearch. And I actually talked to uh, one of the guys uh, today. The interesting thing is that what I'm going to be showing you, what I'm going to be talking about, not necessarily contradict uh, some of this um, uh, indexing and search algorithm that provided by Elasticsearch and other companies. It's actually more of a complement thing, because at the end of the day, you can put Elasticsearch, you can put other technologies on top of your data, but if your data is stored in a, a very inefficient way, at the end of the day, your data access and data analysis will be affected. So, um, <clears throat> one thing is for sure, the data will live somewhere for us to use. So, historically, big data problem was defined by its size, and to speed up the processing, Hadoop gave us two things. It gave us a distributed file system, and it gave us the distributed computation framework, such as MapReduce. So, um, you know, the, the old motto is, you know, we distribute the data, we also give you the framework to, to bring your code to data, and that's kind of the opposite of what we sort of used to or being used to at a time where you know, the data could be spread around and we bring it to centralized processing. So kind of innovative, but was done before many times. But I found actually a problem with that approach. Um, the problem is not necessarily with the approach itself, but rather with the fact that there is um, kind of a compute versus IO mismatch, right? Because, uh, you know, Blocks, we have blocks in Hadoop, then we go the, the blocks, you know, we go into splits, then input formats reading the splits, and then passing the units of data for processing to the uh, MapReduce task. Right? If you think about it, these are two orthogonal problems. Speed of serving the unit of data, right? basically reading it from the disk, and then speed of processing. And if there is a mismatch between the speed of one or the other, then... Um, you can actually have a, a problem because you know we always it's it's very nice to live in the world where let's just get more hardware. But are we using and this is where we, we, I go back to mechanical sympathy? Are we using our existing hardware efficiently to do things? So um, how do we solve mismatch? 
And this is where we get to these uh, very simple things. However, we tend to forget about them a lot, especially when dealing with the high-level frameworks such as MapReduce and Hadoop in general. So custom data buffering. In fact, one of the first samples I'm going to show you kind of deals with that. Uh, data encoding and compression. So um, generalization versus specialization. How many of you use Google protocol buffers? All right. Do you like it? I do, but certain things I've learned that could be done much, much better. And you're going to see it today. So data organization, uh, pages and efficient page creation, uh, meta information about your data. This is actually a very interesting uh, point. You guys are familiar with compression, right? So let's say you've you're ingesting the data, you're storing it, and you decided to save space, or for whatever other reason, you decided to compress the data. And then your analysts ask you, how many records do we have? How would you answer that question? Well, you have to unzip the file and do a line count, right? Just to answer that one question. Um, some of the other information about the data, for example, how, uh, when it was written, so on and so forth. So a lot of this meta information is being completely missed. The irony of it is during the actual capture of the data, that information was available to you for free. Whether you're capturing one record at a time from Socket, you can maintain a counter, whether you're just uh, reading uh, or copying the entire file, all that information was available to you during the capture. And in fact, if you, if, 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 if well, if you're using a custom code, a lot of times you maintain those counters for other reasons, and then you completely dismiss um, their values, right? So page caching. Um, a lot of times, you know, when you, you're familiar with the page caching, when you read the data, you know, the way the, um, the data is read into the page cache, and then um, essentially when you, let's say, try to read it again, it all of a sudden becomes much faster, but that's because it's not giving to you from the disk, but rather from the page cache. So, and... Um, Another thing is the data sampling, which I had two clients to work with, and they wanted to um, you know, talk about, uh, do a sample, uh, sample data, right? So the sample data means that, let's say they captured 24 hours worth of data for something, and they wanted to get 10% of it, but equally representing, you know, evenly distributed. So, I, it's not, so it means that I cannot just take the first, uh, temp, the first uh, block of records and say up to the 10% or the last block of records up to the 10%. So I have to equally distribute it, right? But, which I can't do, you know, count how many records and then divide by 10 and, and skip so many, right? It's doable, but if you are already know, for example, that you're going to be doing certain operations on this data, then certain things could be taken care of in advance. And, for example, with data sampling, all we did is said, well, how are you going to sample it? 10%? Then let's just do one, two, three, four in the round robin and, you know, write 10 different files representing the same data. Not the solution that will fit every need, but, again, to the custom uh, requirements, that was a very easy way to fix it. Now they have 10 chunks representing actually equal distribution of data. So, um, efficient input formats. That's another interesting thing when it comes to I.O. How many of you um, use the word count from Hadoop examples? All right. That's not how you do word count. I mean, that's the most inefficient way of doing it. In fact, the first example will kind of demonstrate some of the um, issues with that. So um, here's the mechanical sympathy uh, slide, which is basically I provided my own definition, which is an ability to write software with a deep understanding of its impact or lack of impact on the hardware it's running on. Uh, here's a link to the blog. And the bottom line is you want to ensure that all available resources, hardware and software, work in balance to help achieve your end goal. And in this particular case, it all starts from a data capture. In fact, I'm not going to spend too much time given the lack of time that we have here, uh, but um, I did a series of talks on uh, um, fast ingest uh, last year, and one of them was a Hadoop Summit, another one was an info, uh, in the QCon, so you can um, get it from there. Um, and I'll give you a quick history of why this talk came about, and although the history goes back to my original talk, but and this one is sort of a derivative, but let's quickly talk about the problem and why all of a sudden some of the existing Hadoop technologies couldn't help me. So, um, I was 
my first client when I came to Horton Rocks was one of the uh, biggest, or if not the biggest, wireless provider in the U.S. Starts with the name A. You can guess what the rest of it is. Um, <laughs> sorry, I can't look. It's funny things that you can't really mention, but you can mention what I just said. Anyway, so um, what their problem was is kind of described here, but let me just kind of uh, do it in my own words. So um, they had uh, devices that were producing data records you know, the ones that NSA likes to look at. Um, so, um, and um, each device was, would produce anywhere between, um, the number here says 300,000, it was actually between 200,000, but it could double or triple during the spikes, right? So that's why I was kind of averaging out between 300, 300,000 to 400,000. So um, that's per second. Each record was about 250 bytes in length. And they had to, uh, uh, um, for the first implementation, handle 52 devices. So you can do the math and realize how much data we had to ingest. So when we try to um, use Flume, Flume, even Flume NG, couldn't really handle that volume of data with the hardware that was provisioned for that particular system. So we had to improvise, and we've succeeded. We actually got on our EC2 cluster a successful test where we were ingesting 10 million of these records per second for a continuous period of 24 hours. Cost the company a lot of money, but at least we knew it's doable. So, and that's really when I start, uh, uh, when I, and again, the, the, the way we did it, and it's all described in that talk, is through a very custom approach, right? But that's, what I, that's the whole point of this conversation is that a lot of times you have products that will solve certain problems, and those are general uh, technologies and frameworks, right? Just like Google protocol buffers. But then there are certain things when you kind of narrow down your domain, could be done much more efficient, much better, much faster. So uh, we're pretty much approaching the demo part. So um, any questions so far? All right. Feel free to you know, raise your hand if you want to. I don't want to really wait till the very end because you know, we're not going to have enough time anyway. <laughs> so um, here's my four musketeers. Um, the CPU, the network, the disk, and um, the memory, right? So these are the four core uh, resources of a um, computer, right? And um, the, this, their speed of development or evolution is not the same. We might have a uh, you know, fast disk but slow processor, or maybe a processor is fast, but what we're trying to do with this needs, requires more um, power and so on and so forth. The same goes for the memory and, and, and other things. So in other words, what I always wanted to be able to do is to say, listen, if I'm going to go to my company and say, I really need more hardware, I want to be able to prove and measure that what I have is used up to the limit, that I cannot squeeze anything more out of my hardware. And in fact, on that presentation, I'm showing some of the things where I'm doing the ingest and I'm choking, but my CPU is relaxing. It's only operating at about 4%. Why is that? Well, because you know, I started my demo written in such a way where I was really I.O. bound. So I had to start improvising, doing various different things. And all of a sudden, I bring it, brought it to balance where my memory, CPU, and, and uh, I.O. was working intact and essentially speed up the processing by about five times. So, and that's essentially what we wanted to do. We want to be able to understand what our resources are doing to address all these problems. So, so in other words, while the topic is titled I.O., or big, big data I.O., or whatever it is titled right now, <laughs> um, at the end of the day, it's really more about understanding how your resources uh, are utilized during um, big data processing. So, um, <clears throat> for example, I mean, like I said, everything kind of starts with the capture of the data, because how you capture the data will affect how everything else is, will affect everything else downstream, data access, searches, and what have you. So, um, and, um, you know, one of the things when it comes to data capture, especially when it comes to streaming data capture, you can never be slower than the data source, right? Imagine what would happen if the data source is producing data faster than you can consume. You're going to have a big problem, right? So, like I said, else is not good. You always have to be kind of come up with an approach. And you don't want to be at the limit. You want to be by several orders of magnitude because, like I said before, 
we had to deal with spikes, right? Sometimes, you know, it could be a natural spike because of the holiday or something like this, or because, you know, something going on in this big metropolitan area. It could be unnatural spikes because a certain device was down, it itself accumulated the backlog, now it throws everything at you, right? So you want to be able to um, handle that. So, and this is where we get to um, the code part, which I'll try to spend the rest of the time is doing coding. So um, these demos are all sort of a very trivial kind of a simple demos. And the whole purpose was to kind of a draw awareness that simple things that we sort of in the big data world tend to forget are still relevant, right? And, um, you know, even when you're dealing with the um, third party technology in your shop, you kind of have to um, understand what it does, how it does it, and if it's going to fit, if it's going to fit your uh, need. So remember I said that word count is not how you do things, right? So here's a very simple demo. Uh, basically what I'm doing here, I've, I have a test file, I'm reading just 1,000 records or well, 10,000 records from it, loading it up in memory, and basically um, doing a regular expression uh, search on that file. Uh, on, on that, what I accumulated. So now I have a data in memory. It's not even I.O. It's all in memory. But the first attempt, I'm doing one line at a time, right? The second attempt, I'm doing it in batch. So let me run it real quick. And we can, like I said, if you're interested, we can look at the code more deeper. So it ran. Um, so here is the first set of results. I do it like 10 times just to get a, a good figure. So it did get a little faster. That's one line at a time. But look at processing the same accumulation, the same buffer, but doing it as a whole, the entire chunk. We basically improve our performance by about five times, right? Just a very simple thing that could, you know, uh, and this is, if you remember the word count, in word count, one of the things that they do, they, um, the reader passes you one record at a time, right? And I understand if the record is huge, a couple of kilobytes or something like that. But in my case, for example, when I was dealing with the 250 bytes worth of... Uh Hello. spin off the entire map task just to process one record to do string tokenization and searches for, um, searches for um, words, right? So if, if you simply would, were to write a, a, a different uh, input file format, different reader, then you would end up in a situation where you would tremendously improve the performance of your, um, of your um, map reduce for this particular problem. But like I said, this is a trivial sample. Let's get into something more interesting. So um, yesterday, I actually wrote, I, have a, I had a different demo, but I decided to make it a little more interesting. So I have this unop unoptimized write, and I have an optimized write. So um, let me kind of give you a little more real estate here. So if you look at optimized write and look at an unoptimized write, the code is identical, right? Basically, I am you know, trying to... Um, what I'm doing here, um, basically, um, I had this uh, quote from Einstein, and I'm just writing it to a file um, 100,000 times. So creating a file, uh, files of 100,000 records each, right? And I'm creating multiple files. I'm creating 1,000 files. And I'm going to be doing it um, first uh, with one thread, and then um, we're going to uh, see what the difference is between optimized versus unoptimized. And then we're going to increase the thread and see what our improvements are uh, going to be. So let's run an optimized first. And um, I expect it to run in about 20, 30, 40 seconds, something along those lines. And while we're waiting, let's look at the code here. And this is where, uh, this is where pretty much all the code, 
right? This is actually the I.O. task that does the actual write. Anybody, um, I think it's done. No, it's still writing. Come on. All right, um, here we go. It took 42 seconds. Sometimes it's, um, I guess my computer, uh, and I don't know why, but sometimes it goes like to 30 seconds, but now it's like 42 seconds. So fine. Anybody can look, oh, actually, before we do that, let's do the same with optimized. Like I said, code is the same, but the difference in the I.O. task. And um, so 42 seconds versus six seconds, right? So um, obviously, the one is faster than the other one by about five, six times, right? So can anybody spot the problem? I mean, I'm using buffered output stream. I am, you know, kind of doing everything that I'm supposed to do when I'm writing the file. All right. Can somebody spot the solution here? It's optimized right now. All right, let me help you. So let's look at the, this particular line of code. I'm creating a new buffered output stream. What's going on behind the scenes? Buffered output stream by itself is just an object. It's easy to create. But internally, because it's buffered output stream, it creates a buffer, which means it allocates the memory. What happens when I say close? Garbage collection, right? And then the next time I want to write another file, it creates another buffer instead of possibly using or reusing the existing buffer, right? Look at the optimized writes. <clears throat> just that fact alone that I just explained to you. I'm using uh, byte buffers. How many of you um, are using Java and I.O. package? OK, so you're familiar with the byte buffer. So I'm using a byte buffer, but what I'm also doing, sure, I'm allocating here, right, just like before. But as you can see, it's part of the if statement, which means I'm doing some type of caching. And you can see I have a context object, which is nothing more than a thread local, because it's only for this thread. I don't even have to synchronize it, right? So thread, when, as soon as the thread finishes, by syncing the file through the file in output stream, it releases that buffer that the next attempt on this thread can reuse the same buffer, the same memory that was allocated before, right? So all of a sudden, all of a sudden, I've, yes. Okay, so I got the question. So the question is that am I allocating the same size or um, and what happens if I have a variable length? Is that correct? Yeah, it's 8K. Well, no, so I could play, so the, the, okay, the question is that in a buffer output stream, the default buffer size is 8K, and, you know, I could definitely increase it. But the bottom line is that even if I were to increase it, I would have to, as soon as I get, as soon as I issue the close on the buffer output stream, it's, and, and create a new buffer output stream, the next, the next cycle is going to allocate a new memory, right? Where in this particular case, I'm actually reusing the same buffer, because now I'm managing the buffer separately from the actual input uh, from the actual output stream. So, and then the, the other question I think that I kind of formulated myself, in this case, I kind of know the length of my record and I know that I'm doing it 100,000 times. So I've calculated the size of the buffer, but I also have uh, a, an implementation of byte buffer kind of extended version where you can create initial size and if it has to expand, it will expand automatically by essentially copying itself to a bigger buffer and so on and so forth. But again, that's just another ways of doing things. It's kind of irrelevant to this particular topic. So, so anyway, um, you see how 
simple things like this could either fix your problem or get you into a problem, right? So, um, but let's uh, do something else. Um, let's try to increase the amount of threads, right? Saying, okay, well, I'm probably dealing with I.O. intensive task, so if I bump the threads by four, I should, you know, make it much faster. So, um, let's try that. And again, for the sake of saving time, I might as well keep on talking, and I'll tell you that it's not gonna be that much faster. Why? Because there is certain things that are happening behind the scene that will never give you, give you one plus one equals two. So obviously, are your resources, you're still contending for the shared resource, which is my single disk on this machine, right? Um, there is still uh, some string um, system array copying going on with an internal implementation, which I actually um, learned the hard way that no matter how many threads you throw at it, when you're dealing with native calls, it's not always going to um, equate to even close to be one plus one equals two. So as, as you can see, we saved, what, three seconds, right? The same thing if I do on optimize actually will show us a better percentage, which essentially shows you or proves to you that um, the memory allocation that we were requesting from our buffered output stream was quite a big problem for us. So here we saved um, almost a half, right? Not necessarily four times, but almost a half. And um, that's quite, in quite interesting. So um, another thing that I was talking about, and I think we only have 10 minutes left. Um, unfortunately, I won't be able to show you everything. But another thing that um, I was going to talk to you about is what I learned uh, when I, in terms of data organization and data storage is that a lot of times, uh, like how many, how many of you, when, when was the last time you were counting bits when it came to the data? Like bits, not bytes, bits. Okay, so um, you're thinking, oh, big data, why would I care about bits? Well, think about that way. Most of the data, business data or machine data, is going to be in ASCII characters. I know I'm in Germany, so I can't be really, you know. But, you know, most of the machine data will deal with the ASCII characters. How many bits do I really need to store any ASCII character? Seven. Seven, right? So what is one bit of eight bits? Like 12%, right? So that fact alone could actually um, um, save you a lot of storage and obviously improve your IO because you're now 12 times smaller. But what I also learned that most of the data, most of the characters that are used, or majority of them, could be stored more between five and six. And that actually gives you into um, a, a better situation. Um, now, another thing is that, um, might as well turn back to the slides real quick. Um, kind of skipping a little bit, but uh, data uh, organization. So for one of my clients, we have to come up with a custom file format. And uh, this is kind of a pseudocode um, showing you what this file format looked like. And I was trying to explain it, uh, I was trying before to explain it, and then I decided like, I'd rather put it on the slide so you can guys, uh, it's better to understand. So here's kind of a sample record, it's, it's slimmed down, but this is actually the records that I was dealing with from uh, call detail records, right? This is what they kind of look like. Um, there is more to that to the right, but anyway. So, and, so the approach is actually not new. So um, think about this way, when you look at this data, when you analyze the data that you're dealing with, and that's a very important topic, you kind of understand that because it's machine data and because of what it represents, there's going to be a huge amount of repetition. And you can say, well, fine, if it's a huge amount of repetition, I can compress it, right? Well, compression will give you a certain benefit, but again, when it comes to data access, you need to be able to, you need to decompress it before you can start using it. So what I start thinking about, what if I come up with a different sort of a, a organization style which allows me to achieve close to the same ratio as compression, or even beat the compression ratio, but at the same time, give me an uncompressed access to this data as is, sort of custom binary uh, file formats. So uh, a simple approach was to, well, there's many different variations that I had throughout the year, but one of the approach that I'm kind of like more than others is, first of all, you, 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 you chunking the data into blocks. In this case, let's say 100,000 records per block, right? And for each block, you're gonna create a dictionary of what's in that block, of values, however you wanna parse them, right? And then you're gonna represent these values, in other words, this is your dictionary, and in green you have basically an index, just for easy, it's not written, but it's uh, 
for you to read, right? And now I can actually write the same four records as array of integers or in a columnar format. And when you do that, actually when I was sort of uh, playing with that, I start noticing that these things, for example, here I have the same value. This priority code, I haven't seen them changing it. It was kind of statically encoded there. The, the timestamp was constantly increasing, but because they produce 100,000 records per second, that means that it would be increasing, you know, I may have the entire batch that will either have one range or will have the same because I have, you know, several hundred thousand records per second. And then you have other uh, values and so on and so forth. So the, the ones in black and random and so on, and, you know, the, the blue ones are same and the orange ones are range, which is something that will change but will continue to be the same until it changes again. So why am I saying that? Well, here's the demo. So remember I mentioned, go ahead. Sure, and well, uh, actually, not necessarily, because while you're, um, you, I agree with you that it's something compression algorithms do. Compression algorithms, some of them do, some of them don't give me uh, access. Because right now, in order for me to read this data, and that's what I was about to show you, I don't have to decompress the file. I could actually read the data as is, right? So, no. I don't have to decompress everything. So, so for example, the questions, is it there or is it not, could be answered by simply doing a lookup in the dictionary without decompressing anything. OK? Some compression algorithms do, some don't. Right? But again, um, <clears throat> these were. Um, I'm sort of generalizing it for the purpose of discussion. Um, there was some specific requirements, for example, this, uh, and again, I can't unfortunately go through all the demos. Um, they had specific requirement to access data by certain fields, and there was other algorithms in place, right? But the bottom line is that, you know, I'm not saying that that, that was the most perfect approach. Um, actually, it's not, because um, I'm working on something that, it, that makes it even uh, smoother. But the bottom line is that when you start thinking about that, it really, the, what I'm trying to drive to is that start thinking about how to organize data more efficiently for the purpose of doing something with it, whatever it is might be. Either use existing compression algorithm that is, you know, as gentleman said, is splittable that you can read without decompressing, or a lot of times you can't. Uh, for a variety of reasons, and uh, a lot of times coming up with these simple file formats that are not that difficult to implement or not that difficult to understand. But let me show you, for example, so when I had that string array, the, the column, right? So um, let me show you um, um, integer encoding demo. So um, Google protocol buffers, right? So initially I started using Google protocol buffers to encode my uh, integers in a column. So um, here's the protocol buffer, and I'm gonna um, do, uh, with, the, with the protocol buffer, I'm basically encoding, I'm generating uh, 100,000 integers within the range, randomly within the range of 50,000. And um, we'll see from the output that, um, our sort of packing compression ratio, whatever it is you want to call it, is you know 1.5, 1. 1. Um, 1.5 basically. So out of 400,000 uh, possible um, values, um, the Google stored it. Google protocol buffer stored it is uh, 266,000 bytes, right? Instead of 400,000 bytes. Now, if I go to and run the same, so um, but the thing is that what what I wanted to pay attention to you to is that. While Google handles any type of integers, right? In my case, since I'm storing offsets here, I'm only dealing with positive numbers. So when you're dealing with the positive numbers, there's a lot of room for improvement. And um, if you look at this demo, then all of a sudden, so we're almost twofold, right? Almost double. Uh, with a Google, right, than what the Google did for this particular specialized use case. Well, now let's do a different thing. So let's say, like in my case, where I had the same value, right? If I go with Google protocol buffers, then I got two times improvement. 
But if I do the same via uh, my sort of a custom encoder, you see the numbers, right? All of a sudden, the entire what could be 400,000 bytes array was stored as nine bytes, right? And I have another sort of a, a sample where um, I'm kind of addressing the ranges of values. Um, so with the custom, I got you know 19 bytes out of the range, um, and um, here I will have well I will have a bigger number. So um, you had a question? You had a question? Go ahead. I mean. I mean, it, un unfortunately, we are getting to the end of... Yeah, I think we're... Um, unfo yeah, 40 minutes is... Uh, but let, let me just do a quick conclusion. Um, so, um, let me just throw... Um, I guess, yeah. There was only a few sort of conclusion slides left, but um, I guess the, the, the idea is that um, there's a lot of um, things that you know, products can handle or products doesn't handle all that efficiently. And there's a lot of things that, um, simple things that you can do yourself, um, whether you're implementing a custom component within a framework, within a technology, or whether it's a custom solution altogether that would um, allow you to um, make your data um, simpler to use. So I guess that's it. Uh, thank you very much. Um, and I'll be around if you have guys, any, guys have any questions. Thank you.